morning. Uh, this is the Fort River School Building Committee. Today is December 20th, um, 2018. Uh, this uh, uh, committee here, uh, committee meeting is being recorded by University Media. Um, did I miss anything on my usual list? Of what I say? That sounds right. Um, and I guess I'd say that before I get into my uh, official agenda, welcome to our two new members who were uh, sworn in practically minutes ago, but probably a day ago. So, uh, Ben Harrington and the Burgess. <laughs> we have no idea how long we've waited for new members. <laughs> <laughs> It is probably close to, yeah, you're right, yeah. Yeah, we haven't had a new, that's uh, true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. Um, so I'm gonna move on to uh, meeting minutes. I did not bring extra copies, I will apologize for that. Um, I did I probably have like a copy of each one um, to take extra notes on, but we have two sets of minutes to record, uh, both the, 7th and the 20th of November. Um, and so I guess I'll start with the older one, the 7th. Are there, I, mean, I realize people are going way back in their memory banks at this point, but are there corrections to this or uh, could we if not could we entertain a motion? But first, I guess, are there corrections? Hearing none. Can I have a motion? Uh, move to approve the minutes of November 7th. All in favor? Yeah. Uh, moving on to the 20th, a slightly more recent in time. Oh, sorry. Um, we didn't discuss who's taking minutes today. Yeah. Recording votes, it's going to be easier if we do that now. Yes, I would agree. Uh, can I ask for a volunteer? I'd love to volunteer myself, but I already have one set that I'm behind on. on to the meeting minutes from the 20th. Do folks have corrections to the meeting minutes from the 20th? Move the approval of the meeting minutes of the 20th. Second. All in favor? Uh, public comments is our next uh, agenda item. So then we'll move on to uh, reviewing project progress and, and, and costing updates uh, with the STAP. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here again, so, so quickly. Um, I'll preface our presentation saying we, we definitely made progress in response to your comments last week. There was a good, just healthy discussion last week, so we haven't got everything done at this point. Just, just be aware of that. I'd also like to introduce Rachel Loeffler from Berkshire Design Group. Uh, she's been working on the site and civil aspect of the project. So uh, one agenda for our topic today is to look at those costs of site in a little more detail. So we have her here to guide us through the scope. I but should add also I'm an Amherst resident, so I care very much about how this affects us. <laughs> very good, I didn't know that. So I'm gonna move the presentation and then open it up for discussion. <laughs> Um, again, our presentation goals. Uh, we have some updates to the estimate, which we want to uh, orient to begin with. Then the site scope, looking at the, the detailed estimate. Um, and then we're generally reviewing assumptions. Um, I suppose that's also looking forward as to what the next step should be. Um, so this should look familiar. This is a, a blow up of option A in the estimate. And I put a red box around one of the major updates um, that we realized um, after last meeting is that there was an error in the estimate regarding the PV count quantity. Um, and so now we have corrected that quantity. Previously it had 87 kilowatts for option A, which didn't match up with our narrative and it's something we had missed. So the cost for the PV panels is, is quite a bit more than we presented last week. Uh, now this is assuming you purchase the panels as part of the project as opposed to a lease agreement, which would reduce this to zero in terms of project costs. Go ahead, then. How does that um, align with what was shown in the drawings for, for quantity? It, this quantity matches the drawings in the narrative. Okay. It was the estimator who had grabbed the wrong quantity and brought it right through. It scaled it down appropriately between each option, 
so that also deceived us a little bit, but then we finally caught up to it. Uh, so this will affect that net zero premium slide, which I've also included in the presentation. But the first thing it does is, you can see it's adding to the direct cost by 3.9 million, and then um, increasing the construction cost once you bring the burdens in, it's about four, four and a half million more. Go ahead. Sorry, a question. This is just for the actual panel, not the part, because part of the drawings include installation, like kind of the canopies and all these things. That's taken into account in this cost, or this is just the panel per se? This is all. It's It's got the canopies as well um, at the this time. The installation cost. Of yeah. The so so this is includes installation? It does. It includes installation. It includes the roof, the ground, and the canopies. Um, so when they scale it down, they, they scale it down because the cost of installation of the different places is very different. So it's different to start in, in a right. field than in a road than in... I think they're using a different rate when they get to option E and it's a smaller quantity. Smaller quantities typically have a higher rate. Uh, but it's, it's being looked at at a certain level of detail, looking at the overall quantity and what rates of that size typically go for. Okay. Uh, so I understand if we wanted to say maybe save some money by getting rid of parking canopies and go ground mounted, I don't know if the estimate has that much um, that much detail in it at this point. Okay, so yes. that would be something it. as we further develop that we can go into that kind of detail. Can yeah. I just get clarity that the one thousand one thirty two kilowatt that's that's the rate of installed capacity we're assuming. Is that is that how to read this chart? I believe so. Our narrative, um, and I could pull up the narrative and read how it was in the context there, that may help. Um, but the estimators grabbed a number from the narrative. I, I believe that's the answer, yeah. Um, so now we've updated up the construction cost for all of our options relative to that um, increased cost of PV. Um, and so you see op option A goes up the most because it has the most PV. Option E and F, which have very small arrays, were less effective. Um, the other revision we made in this go round is we heard your comment about what should the soft cost be for this project. And isn't 130% um, of an increase really a little more than MSPA averages? And when you look through the benchmarking that someone shared, Maria shared, it's true, it's on the higher end. And I think we were being conservative. You definitely find projects that are at 130, even higher, um, but they're usually smaller projects in general. So being a larger project, we feel very comfortable using 125%. Uh, so that was, a, that was a helpful comment. So we've made that change as well. And that brings everything down by 5%. Um, so it almost offsets the, the PV increase with regard to option A. And then for options D and E, which had less of a PV increase, they've actually become less expensive than we looked at last time. The cost is less. Um, so if you follow from there, those are the two major updates in terms of cost. And so here's all of the project costs now updated to reflect those two revisions. Um, and just moving quickly through that, we can come back if you want to talk about the specific options. Um, and so the PV panel cost also affects our net zero premium slide. Um, and so we've updated it as well to point out that, and, and we've gone into a little bit more about these two paths that we presented last, last time. The concept between the two paths holds up, even though the PV panel costs are higher, in that um, if you go and use a, a lot of PVs and don't push your building efficiency and, um, so far, it's actually probably a cheaper route to get to net zero. That's the that's the top one. But go ahead. I have a question. Here it says PV panel cost six million. Before we were talking three million. That's because of the compounded interest of all the sub cost. Um, Correct. This is the project still, cost number. So but still, uh, I think my calculations last time was a fifty percent, fifty. Uh, it should be about fifty-five percent increase based on the construction cost of that. Well, to get to construction cost, and then you have to go to project cost. Yeah, but that's why. So if you go from, um, so if you go from uh, this TV panel, then if you add up all these numbers plus the minus twenty five percent, with the seventy percent was fifty eight percent increase from the construction cost, because that number is almost a. Uh, 
Yeah, I, this is consistent. I'm not quite sure about your numbers right now. We should we should do a check now that we've made a couple revisions about the, the burden. But I, I believe this is accurate. So and it is doing exactly what you said. We just increased it according to the burden to get to construction costs and then multiplied by 1.25 to get to project costs. Yeah, but because all the, the other cost is uh, 2023 20, percent plus Yeah, that's given in the estimate. It's, it uh, it's in that area. three bucks. It was right there on option A. So it's okay. three thousand per kilowatt, or three dollars per watt. Um, I'll have to check on the efficiency. When I ran it at twenty-two percent efficiency, I I got a lower ballpark number than one thousand uh, one hundred thirty-two. I was getting lower than a thousand. That. So it'd be interesting to see so you that. Ran it, you took a building EUI of a certain square footage? Yeah, I used yep. 85,000 square feet at a 30 EUI. I got two and a half million roughly KBTU per, per year energy usage. When I took that to kilowatt hours, I got 747,362. And I don't know what they assumed for the output per year, but I ran it at 1,100. Sure. I don't know if that's. So I got a a needed rated KW capacity of 679. I can, I can tell you already, it's because you work with 30 EUI. So this okay, so number. that's a 50. It's I a thought you were still on the 50. Yeah. Yes, I thought you were, but down below, I'm still getting. So let's talk about that. That's just right over That's perfect. Um, so we had based the numbers originally on the 50 EUI scenario because we recognized it would be the least costly way to achieve the bylaw and get to net zero. Um, last time we met, there was definitely an interest of um, getting to EUI 30 with the building. Um, and so that would reduce the number of PV panels. The site plan shows um, this, let's see if I can point, this um, black box around the ground mounted array. That reflects how much that ground mounted array would be reduced, would be reduced down to that size. And you'd have fewer PV, so the PV panel cost would also come down. You can see it's about 60% of the, I think it's exactly 60% of the cost if we went with EUI 50. Um, so there's a savings there in terms of having fewer PVs if you choose to buy them as part of the project. The cost increase is due to um, measures that would be required to get our 50 building, which is relatively um, achievable. It's still a high performance building, uh, but it wouldn't have to necessarily have the geothermal wells and some of the envelope increase items. So. There was a question last time as to what those items are. So the next slide goes into that. But I don't want to go past your question. Did I answer it for now well enough? Well, I guess what the efficiency assumption is going to affect it, obviously. We, sure. we need fewer panels. We might be able to get it all on the roof, I think, if we went to a high efficiency panel. OK. So I can, it'd just be good to tease I, some of those assumptions apart. I know that's not. In now, although it was discussed with our team, but I can't recall the number to. And I'm just, get it for you. I'm wondering if the cost, I mean, building the, uh, you know, canopy is going to be expensive. So I'm wondering if the extra cost on efficient PV panels might more than compensate for getting rid of panels on the ground level. If we if we get fit, uh, I got a, a ballpark of 33,000 square feet of, of high efficiency. For a certain so, UI. Yeah, and okay. maybe you could put that on the roof, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe. 
Well, so one of the other aspects with roof is, depending on which mechanical system you go with, they require more or less roof storage. So, as we mentioned, we went EUI 50. You can see we've we've blocked out a pretty good size area of the roof for rooftop VAB units. Um, so, if we go to EUI 30, we're talking about mechanical systems that have smaller rooftop uh, elements and we'd have more PV area. So this site plan is close. It may be a little better on the EUI 30 in terms of the amount of stuff on the ground. Um, so let's talk about what would an EUI 50 building do um, in terms of new construction and renovation. Um, let's start with the new construction. For new construction in an EUI 50 building, um, you have a full kitchen, which is fine. Um, you have summer programs that we understand, or we think you do. Um, and EUI 50 building, we could achieve that with full full building year-round use. Um, it's really not not a problem. Um, for glazing in an EUI 50 building, just having insulated glass with a low E coating will get us there. Um, percentage of glazing can go up to 40%, we can get to EUI 50. It's a, it's a very achievable goal for a school. Um, R25 walls, R30 roof. Um, basically, energy code, we're meeting energy code, which energy code has become more stringent over the years, but um, we don't have to go much further than meeting energy code to get to EUI 50. Um, VAB with energy recovery, when we met with your facilities director, they, they asked us to make sure we included this system uh, because it was the most maintainable, the most familiar to the, to the staff. Um, and so here it is, it's, it's not the most efficient, um, but it works for a EUI 50 building, um, and we do it a, a lot in schools still. Um, and all LED lighting, which is basically industry standard at this point, but it's very efficient, it's important to have that. Um, so then you say, well, what would it require to go further to get to the EUI 30? Um, so again, we noted that you've got the full kitchen in this scenario as well. I don't, I don't think you have an option to get away from that. The full kitchen uses energy, so we're just noting. And Jesse, while I kind of understand the impact of the kitchen, you might yeah. just want to elaborate slightly on why having a kitchen would actually impact that. Sure, yeah, I mean, there's ventilation requirements for the hoods in the kitchen that are um, causing us to bring in a lot of air from outside. Um, and this is generally why ventilation, not just having kitchens, but um, schools require a lot of uh, ventilation air to be brought into classrooms. And so this is why it's more challenging. We can push the envelope on a school way up in terms of thermal performance, but we're still bringing in a lot of outside air and needing to temper and heat cool that air to provide it to students um, as to meet code requirements. Um, so bear that in mind. I know there are um, some really low EUI projects in the area and I mean, we want to push as far as we can in this, for sure. Um, but we're also trying to be somewhat conservative in our study and set goals that we can, we can meet. Um, so the alternative would be a satellite kitchen or a right. warming kitchen where food is prepared elsewhere and then just brought in. Some districts just operate that way, so it sort of takes this, this issue away. But that's not the way I understand yeah. guys work. I mean, if it's just for any context, we've had that model where, where some of the kind used to be uh, we have it now at Helen Elementary School, which is not part of the Amherst Public Schools, but it's something that I'm above with. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a preferable model in terms sure. of the food quality and, you know, it, not just the delivery, the logistics actually, the piece of the problem is more just the experience of students eating food. So one of the things that I know the chair has heard for the regional schools is the move of somebody got into high school, like immediately the food quality seems way better. It's the same food, but it's not, it's not on site. Our experience has been on-site kitchen is much more horrible the student experience. Yeah, and that's fine, and we knew that, and we think it, it doesn't get in the way of your goals of meeting EUI 30, but we wanted to know if that was one of our oh, assumptions. Oh, absolutely. I just wanted to offer local context. Sure. <coughs> um, so, I, I just want just to, to clarify, because I think what I'm getting is that with if you have a full kitchen, which is something that we want, it's going to be harder to get something lower than EUI 30. Is that what you're saying, or am I misinterpreting? Sure. Well, not having a full kitchen makes it easier. So yeah, I agree with you. You're saying okay. the same thing. That's I think I think to put this slide into perspective, uh, 
we're talking about typical components here. We've not got an energy model at this point that tells us a full kitchen pushes you over and you're going to be at 31 now as opposed to 29. I mean, we're, we're not doing that kind of stuff. But just in general, I think you, you could get behind the idea that the full kitchen is going to make it a little harder. If you took it away, it would be easier. Um, and the same kind of general statement um, with regard to operations of the building, we'd be looking for opportunities to um, tailor the building use um, so that we don't have to necessarily run the whole building all summer, let's say. Um, maybe the summer programs are, are known to be limited parts of the building uh, and we're not, we're not planning on conditioning the building all through the summer. Um, and that's, that's thinking about how the building's used and perhaps not, not designing for full use all year round. Another way to think about this, this list under the EUI 30 is that there are choices that, that you have to make to, to get from 50 to Correct. 30. Right. Um, and this is a way to kind of test out which which ones of these. We proposed a couple, right? right? So it could be maybe maybe your summer programs really don't take the whole building. I, I can't remember what you told us in that regard. Right. Yeah, so, so that would be acceptable. Our current summer programs built just about all of Crocker Farm. <coughs> okay. um, Including the preschool wing, so um, I think certainly from an operations perspective, we could maintain having summer programs at Crocker Farm. It, it actually seems like uh, maybe not the right phrasing, but perverse incentive to have students remain at a less efficient building so that the EY of this building stays lower. Even if from an energy perspective, <laughs> we'd rather close Crocker right. Farm, which is less efficient, and have it at this building. So that's it's not mine to result. You know, so we could maintain that at Crocker Farm. It's actually an advantageous because the preschool is part of our summer program, so having them maintained in the same spaces. Um, so I wouldn't be pushing to sure. need summer use of this building. It's more a community question. Right. From a programming standpoint, um, sort of an aside about the energy usage of Crocker Farm, we probably want to maintain that model anyway. Maria? Can, can I just go back a little bit? If, if you didn't use Crocker Farm, though, would you still need to use all of this building would would it would it be full building use or would it still be part building use? So the other there's other um, non for profit or private vendors that do use our buildings over the summer with multi arts camp and other ones. So you know that's the variable would be that we'd have to control their use. That they tend to use a relatively small part of the building as compared to our summer academic programs. So I think as I'm reading the language, it's not that you're shutting down the building. You just there's certain sort of right. parts of the building that you're using, right, right. and I don't think that would be a big ask of, from our perspective. I think the only variable I'll say is if this building was a building like this was to move forward that had a preschool wing, you know, it'd be really unfortunate to not have the summer programs in a location that's frankly more central to the town. But but again, I, I think in the overall scheme of things, that's not it's not something I would feel is a huge issue. Really, all we're trying to make sure as we look at this is are we about right? That's for, right for the, the level of choices. And I'm not seeing this as a huge issue from the operations of the district. Bear in mind, we're making a study. So exactly. if, yeah. if we're comfortable with these kinds of things in our study to talk about what a EUI 30 is versus a EUI 50, I actually think it's advantageous for the study to continue to talk about both. Right. Yeah. 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 Rachel, did you want to add something? Quick question. Yeah. I understand not having programming during the summer months decreases your energy consumption footprint. I also want to ask about in the context of climate change and higher temperatures overall throughout the year, how that fits in with this model. Should we, um, does that anticipate those changes, increases in temperature generally um, every day of the year? Well, I think the question is, at what year? Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 50 years from now, probably not. 100 yeah. years from now, who knows? Right. right. But in a 30 year, 30 year window. It's significant. Want to go through more of them? Yeah, I'd like yeah. to continue. Um, another operational um, decision that we would consider in an EUI 30 path is relaxing interior temperatures. That means in the summer, um, maybe we're going to go to 77 or 78 degrees as our set points in the room um, and just keep humidity lower. And in the winter, um, we're not going to heat up to 72, we're going to heat to 68. Um, and uh, that would help um, lower energy use. One of the key words here is with lower humidity because you go to a higher temperature if you can maintain the lower humidity and still relatively comfortable. So we want lower humidity in our chilled beam building anyway. We don't have to do humidity control 
Yeah, so the, as, as it, this goes with our mechanical system, which is coming up, it, it's either chill beam or VRF. They, they both have the ability to control humidity in a different way than the VAV does. The VAV would kind of want you to set a lower set point to take the humidity out. Um, so we can keep the humidity low, but let the set point rise up with this kind of a system. And you're right, we also need to keep humidity lower with the chill beam to um, make sure there's not compensation. Um, and we can talk about that part of that system as well if we want to, but I'd rather just keep getting through this. It's coming up. Um, triple glazing, uh, we know what that is, right? That's three layers of glass, um, makes our windows more efficient. Um, we could do that, that may help us get to E by um, 30. Um, our walls and roof, we can insulate them even more. Uh, R35 and R60 um, should get us there. Um, we can put insulation under the slab continuously as opposed to just the first four feet uh, from the perimeter wall, which is what we typically do in EUI 50. Um, so that would help. Um, and then the mechanical system, which is worth discussing, um, operational considerations. So either chill beam or VRF, um, both with geothermal, which has a price tag to it, but really goes a long way towards uh, reducing overall energy demand. And then there's the operational considerations of these systems. The VRF, as we presented a long time back, if you remember, has um, filters and units in each classroom that need to be changed out so often. So that's kind of a downside there, because you have to coordinate uh, maintenance activities with classroom use. The chill beam is better in that way. The, the maintenance is, is less. The consideration is if the window's open and the chill beam's on, um, humid air could come into the room and condense on the cool beam. Uh, but that's something we control the use of monitors on the windows so that the system knows when the, when the window's open or we don't provide operable windows, that's the other way to go. Um, and so we can manage that. We've done chill beams in a number of schools. It's been successful. Um, so there are, are benefits to that system and it's more efficient, but it's also a little more complicated system. And so your facilities director at the time when we looked at it said, I'm not sure this is most appropriate for us. We feel much more comfortable with the traditional VAD system. So it's, those are the kinds of um, hurdles, I suppose, that what we run into in a public school going to EUI 30 is if, if a community is behind it, we can do all these things for sure. Um, it's just a matter of that discussion happening. And then we mentioned we could do radiant flooring on the ground floor, providing heat right, right at the demand level is, is more efficient. Um, and in the elementary school, it's kind of a nice idea. Um, kindergartners, pre-K are on the floor all the time. so. I've never heard of this being done, but is it possible to do radiant flooring on a second floor if you're doing concrete on the second floor? Anyway? We've done that as well. Yeah, we can. Um, we picked the ground floor because it seemed to be more tied to energy, but just providing, um, yeah, that would help actually. You're right, that would be more efficient. There's a cost to radiant flooring, so that may be another. The, you know, the benefit how much is do you want to do? You can reduce the ambient air. You, you right. feel more comfortable. Right. You get that radiation effect. Correct. Um, a couple of people since the last meeting asked me a bit about geothermal, and, I, and I'm not going to be the expert to describe anything, but one of the queries was, um, at this point in the process, have people really done enough in terms of understanding the ground, you know, and, and the feasibility and the real cost of doing geothermal at the site? And, and I'm not expecting, like, yes, and I have all the answers, but just if you could give me a way to respond to people are. who ask that question, I just don't know the answer to that. Okay. We haven't done what's called a conductivity test to see what the... the Someone used that term, so that's great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, a measure of the, um, the transmission of BTUs from the earth to whatever uh, uh, fluid we use. Okay. Um, that test would have to be done in order to determine the number of wells and the depth of the wells, but we can guesstimate based upon prior experience, but it might be 200 wells. The quantity is in the narrative. It is. Uh, okay. We'd have to look at that. I think it's yeah. just over 100, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For the level of study, that's that's probably the adequate level of exploration. That's perfect. I can answer that question. I said geotechnical exploration. That's what I was just going to say. I mean, it, um, there is another question that we need to address, which we'll get to later. But 
will the geotechnical answer that question? And um, if, if it doesn't, is it something that we should consider looking at as part of our study? And I, I'm just throwing it out there. It's it does not. The geotechnical is not for structural reasons. Uh, and the test for conductivity is, is different. You actually have to core into um, the earth quite a depth uh, and then insert a coil, a closed loop, in order to, to measure the temperature of the fluid going in and the temperature coming out. That's what determines the conductivity. And geotechnical people don't normally do that, but geothermal well contractors are accustomed to doing that. I don't know if you can add that scope if you're interested in it. Can you, can you give us a ballpark about what something like that would cost? I mean, if you if you know that, or if it's something that we need to... Yeah, at some point we need to circle okay. back to our budget, which is not a yeah. topic tonight, right. but we'll be on the topic of course But maybe we could talk about that. Yeah, we, we can get a quote. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just, just so we think about whether we do. <coughs> Okay, well, we made it through the first half of construction. <laughs> I need to go faster. Um, for renovation, I guess the overall, I'm trying to make it a little faster, it's mostly the same stuff pushed into the renovation category. One thing we realized is when we had presented renovation last time, we said our estimate reflected a higher EUI of 65. Um, but then as we talked about it as a team, we realized that we could really get the renovation areas to EUI 50 with the costs that are in the estimate. So the estimate reflects EUI 50 for both new construction and renovation. So it's, they're equal. We could take them both up to 30. Um, and so for renovation, it's, it's kind of the same operational things, the higher insulation, uh, but the cost to bring a renovation up to 30 is going to be more. We're gonna to have to do a lot more to the walls. And, and so um, that, that premium to go to EUI 30 in the renovation area is gonna be much higher relative to the renovation costs. Go ahead. So on this list, there would be insulation in the walls, too? For EUI 50, um, no, actually. We would replace the windows, we would do the roof. So it would be made in like our, the existing R. Yeah, it's like two or five. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's pretty low. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But you're no, getting no thermal mass, mass, but that's, that, that, that's You don't it. get much. No. Yeah. And it's because the cost to really insulate those walls would be substantial. Uh, so it's going to make a renovation option. Not Consider, consider, yeah. 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 And the existing so, is like R, what'd you say? R2? I've done no analysis yeah. of that. I, I just said maybe five, but um, actually, actually less. Better number. And does that even, like, I guess if you're doing modeling, you would have to meet the energy code by doing modeling. Because isn't that like R10 minimum for walls? And yeah, but in a renovation, I think you're working off the renovation scope. Oh, okay. So, right. right. Yeah. And so the, to meet the code, you look at the overall. in EUI 50, we could use the existing boilers. So the other question that came up was fossil fuel or not fossil fuel, which is really a separate question from EUI. Um, we did hit on a little bit in the slide, just to continue, just to keep you confused. Um, is uh, We can use the existing boilers, which are gas boilers, as we show in options E and D, because we kept that boiler room. Um, they're very efficient, so they can get to EUI 50. Or we could go all electric, and, and we may need a small geothermal heat pump. Um, um, there was a question about how our VAV system is um, is operating without gas, and it would be a heat pump based rooftop unit. Um, so it could be all electric in that VUI 50 if you wanted to get rid of the existing boilers. You know, it's, we were thinking renovation scope, you're probably trying to keep as much that's good intact and reduce cost if you're going down the renovation road. So we originally thought, well, you keep the boilers because they're the newest, and they're efficient, uh, but they are fossil fuel. So that would be a decision you have to do. So getting back to what's in the current cost estimates, because when I, I, I read back through the, the pricing narrative, and it's, it said the you know, current systems will be removed in total, or whatever the phrase is. Right. So are the, so I'm back to, yeah. do the cost estimates include a gas boiler that's existing in just 2010 gas boilers or not? Right. Um, 
I think they do for those options that um, reuse them. So the ones that keep the boiler room in place. Uh, so D and E, I believe, uh, include keeping the existing gas boilers, but, but, not, but the not the others. That that's my best answer on that. Right. Now. Um, let's see what's different targeting EUI 30 in a renovation. <coughs> Um, we're still going to go to chilled beam for the mechanical system or VRF. I think otherwise it's the same stuff. Um, I'm going to keep, keep moving. If that's fine. Well, what about um, the uh, increased uh, insulation under slab? Is that. We can't do it. Not possible. We just wouldn't do it. Yeah, you wouldn't have that. So we're going to push on other things to get there. Not any one of those is like required, but those are the things we would be looking at. Um, I just Sorry. wanted to put up this mechanical system spreadsheet one more time. It's the same one you've seen before. Um, to remind you about VAVs being the, the lowest initial cost, but operational cost, because they're not that efficient, is the highest. But maintenance is very good. And so that's kind of how public schools still end up there. Whereas um, chill beams with the geothermal and ground source heat pump, um, initial cost is probably the highest. Operational cost is going to be the best. The, they're the cheapest to operate because they're so efficient. Um, and then maintenance we had is a three. Um, so it was uh, you know, in the middle in terms of maintenance effort. And uh, VRF was, was worse in terms of maintenance with the filters in the classroom. So it all kind of this decision is going to affect all different aspects of your operations. Um, here. Yeah. I, it, it, we've sort of moved on. I was actually, to be honest with you, yeah. just going to thank you for the previous slide sure. detailing the EOI targets and typical components because we kind of belabored and gave you a hard time last meeting no, about okay. wanting to see this stuff, and you did it, and I just really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, we may what, I was looking, what I was looking for. Okay, well, thank you. thank you. We may still think of more items to go in there as you as you crunch through this. It's. Uh, I, just, I just think it's very. I think it's very. I mean, when I when you think of the end product, the end deliverable. Yeah. It, the problem with the earlier slides that are at a higher level is that it gives. It's a hard. It's hard for the public, or frankly, just for me. To be able to sort of lift the hood and say, "What are you really talking about?" Right. And so, giving this extra detail is just extremely helpful. Yep. And I think will be helpful to the final deliverable. Wonderful. So. I have a question regarding this slide. For example, I don't know. Uh, maybe you can tell me if it's hard to see or there's somebody there too. So, relaxing the, the temperature. That's free. Although in most cases, right? Yeah. Right. That is. That's free. Um, sure. Um, but for example, the insulation, the rough insulation going through an R from 30 to 60, how does it compare goes with windows from double place to triple place? How? Right, as you pursue a EUI 30 path, you're gonna look at cost benefit for each of these items and see, see which ones are preferable to you. That's yeah, but it because maybe there's a middle point, that's what, there is, right? So you don't have to do a EUI 50 building or a 30 building. You could do a 41. But, and, um, but maybe some little changes pushes you to a lower. Okay, that's true. So, uh, so, so sometimes something maybe is cheap, but one change relates to the temperature. That's pretty Right. I, I really think that EUI 50 is conservative, actually. I think okay. in this community, we're likely to do better than that. Um, but we, we are taking or conservative approach to the feasibility study in general. Yeah, no, just so. to compare cost when we're talking that there's a one point five million dollar difference between an R fifty sure. to a thirty. Maybe there's, yeah, so that maybe there's an equilibrium power at some point, that's what I'm saying. Uh, which power do they this to cross? The challenge yeah. on that though, I think I mean the difference between thirty and fifty is already sort of trying to do that by looking at yeah. What's the cost of getting to 30? What's the cost to do 50? That's giving you essentially that information of what the delta would be. And obviously, that table showed different movable parts. I mean, logically, if you were going to shoot for 40, for example, because you thought it'd save you money, it would be some combination of those things right, that right. would have to be included to get lower, right? I mean, it's in 
what the specific, I mean, I think the cha this is where I was complimenting you actually, right. was that I recognize that getting too much more granular than this is requiring a depth of analysis in the study that probably yeah. isn't in the scope right. and the budget and the time span, time, time span, which is why I appreciated you offering more detail because I think that gives us that happy medium where people can understand what we're looking at. You'll probably have lots of really great questions that'll push the dialogue further. Um, but you know what I mean? Without, but without literally saying, let's get down to a menu, the construction menu, yeah. and composite what it looks like from 30 straight through 37 through 43 through 50, which I think is unrealistic. Right. And, and put it in some context, this is an exercise, if we were going forward with a project, you would be doing for the, almost the life of the project, certainly until I right. set this thing out to bid, but then you'd actually have a whole other step, which would be making sure the building, as it was constructed, performs the levels right. that you had set. And so this is a, this is like the very baby step. Um, Simulation of what you'd be doing if you're doing the full project. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I agree that 50 is conservative, and I, I think to be doing a zero energy school, we should be in the, the 30 range mm -hmm. or below. But I think 30 is a good, seems like a good, uh, reasonable number to, to work off of for now. And as you get into construction design, I think you, you may find out you can go lower. And right. sure. You may find it's too expensive. It, it, is a, it is a reasonable number. We've done EUIs close to 30 yes. without being at zero. So it is achievable. Yeah. You, you have to pay a certain premium to get there, but, but communities find it worthwhile. I, I think the vote, a couple of votes at town meeting indicated that this community is interested in, in pushing it in that direction. So I think using 30 is one of the targets. Yeah, and I'm assuming we we need to keep talking about the 50 just so we can answer the question to the community. Like, what are we getting for all this extra money while well, we're getting a net zero building? And this is the premium we're paying for it. We, we were talking at the last, or you were talking at the last meeting about how could we compare these? What's the apples and oranges? And I don't know if it's easy to do uh, carbon dioxide estimated output. That might be an interesting way to compare the six options and so that because people, what we're buying in a sense in this community is reduction of our carbon. And that might be the most interesting way to cross test the, the option. So for $10 you know, million dollars more, you get this much more reduction of CO2 output and we decide, hey, this is where we can afford to go or something. This is one thought. It's interesting. We could look at that. We can, I like I'm not familiar with Just you're looking at your your combustion, right. uh, yeah. you know, your and any of the renovation models where you leave some of your combustion sources. You know what they're you're gonna your energy output is gonna be, and theoretically in your total net zero model you have a net zero output. So we can sort of judge. It's not going to be between models within the net zero. It would be a comparison between the different renovation versus new construction. Understood. Because we're burning gas, but you can use there. Yeah. All that now, work. if you go on the renovation to all, if you're not burning gas there, then that changes that. Right. I, I think what you're getting at, just to kind of bring it down to, to, to the more basic, are you talking about like? What is the carbon footprint yeah, of the different buildings? Right, right. Which I think a lot of people can understand and say, oh, I get it. This is a much lower carbon footprint. Okay. We can look at that. We may be able to do that. I'm not sure. Take a look. So I don't want to necessarily cut this off because I think it's very valuable, but at the same time, it's quarter after. I want to make sure we get the site scope. Uh, the question well. Yeah. Yeah. Last item um, I wanted to share before we decide was these cost benchmarks we put together. This this was to address a question from Maria at the very end about it seems like our cost per square foot at construction cost is higher than NSPA benchmarks that I have here from uh, NSPA published data, which was helpful. Um, and we shared it with our estimator. And, and our response was we really have to look close into what that construction cost per square foot includes for each project. And so this is a detailed analysis we developed with our estimator, picking on two of the projects um, on that um, spreadsheet, the previous Wildwood project, um, as he had estimated it, 
and then the uh, Maple Elementary School in East Hampton, which is currently in design. Um, and to kind of see how all different factors are weighing into that number that gets um, posted on the MSBA spreadsheet, which is at the bottom of the first box, it says cost per square foot. That's the construction cost per square foot for each of the three projects, 601, 441, I guess if you round it up, and 501. Um, but then if you look up the, um, the spreadsheet, you can see building costs, which is kind of what we think about as what we can most obviously address in terms of you know how what's in a building and what's not. Ours is 294, the wild one was 275, and the Maple Elementary School is higher, uh, 326, which we're benchmarking somewhere in between those. I mean, we understand the Maple School is, is bigger, um, so we typically have less um, of a cost per square foot, uh, but it's, it's higher than where we are with our smaller school, and we're a little bit higher than Wildwood. The thing about the Wildwood is it's not escalated up, it's still a 2016 estimate. So, so then we realized, well, we need to sort, still make these apples to apples because they're, they're not perfect. Um, the, the scope in each one is different. So that's the, that's the box at the bottom, cost leveraging, where we have um, the fact that Fort River is estimated with the PV, which we just talked about. The others don't have PV, so we need to take that out. Um, we need to escalate Wildwood to 2020, uh, as well as Maple Elementary School to 2020 to match up with Fort River, so we've done that. And then um, Maple Elementary School is not a CM at risk, it's a design bid built, so there's a 5% cost difference there. And so um, a more fair comparison of these three in terms of um, construction costs would be 552 for Fort River, 493 for the previous project here, and then 565 for Maple Elementary School. Um, and so then we're like, oh, I, I feel like we're right, we're right in the, we're benchmarking well with our costs. Um, so I have a question, do you know the um, what, what are the numbers of the other two projects? The UI are the 50, 30? No, I don't know. The because I think that's going to have some impact. It would. Our EUI and our numbers is, is the 50. Yeah, right. so but the other two is, uh, Maple is, is 30. It's a very different because we already know by those estimations our numbers will be from this one. Yeah. But so it's not that 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 it's um, also, sometimes with the bigger schools, uh, the square footage of certain things that you have to have there uh, has a different impact on the square footage of our own construction, the right? Programming. The programming is different and those have an impact on the square footage. How much special needs per total or how much the radius. Sometimes they don't scale linearly with the number of students in the school. I agree with that. I guess what was interesting to me here is that the Maple School starts at a higher cost per square foot building, right, 325. But when you look at the construction cost line that's posted to the MSBA, it's actually much, much lower. Um, and it's really that, that le leveling exercise that needs to happen. I think one of the big differences is the site work. The Maple School is over twice as big right. as ours, but the site work is not twice as much as what we have in ours. Right, for both. Site work for ours is a much higher percentage because we have a smaller building yeah. and we still have this big site. Um, so so that's, that's a good segue to look at site, but also hazmat and building demo is, is actually a higher percentage uh, than some of the other projects. So, um, and then the burdening is higher because we're in feasibility study right now, um, whereas they're in SD, so yeah. they've refined their estimates down a little bit further, so some of those costs have already moved up into building costs. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I was going to say that um, I'm curious about this, is CM contingency missing from the, the Maples? It's not because they're doing design build. Oh, okay, so it's a different model. It's 
a different approach to yeah. Go ahead. Just it's kind of related to Irene's question. So if I was surprised, perhaps I should have been on page three, not the eighty tall pulled out, but the, the pretty significant difference in square foot costs for A A A one, A two, and A three. Um, ranging from 600 to 646. Um, I know they're different models, and those, you know, preschool is not, preschool is larger, smaller, and I wonder if that was that's hitting on the same point that it's, RNA it's, was. That's the yeah. side cost. The side cost is the same for all of them, and it, I think it goes from, we did the calculation the other day, to, from 50 to 18 or 19. It's a considerable portion of your uh, overall cost, depending on the, the footprint of the, of the number of students on the square footage. But the side cost remains the same if we can adjust your budget. Not quite sure I'm following all of that, but this is and I don't want to believe it. I know there's other things to get to in the meeting. Yeah, I mean, I'll let Maria make a comment. And then what I would like to, to yeah. say is that maybe we can move on to the site. Because I think the benchmarking is something we can talk about yeah. for, for some time and sure. over multiple meetings based on other benchmarks. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm going to say is if you, if you look at through those, the site cost is exactly the same in all of those. It's a, it's a larger percentage. Oh, I see. Right, of, of, the, of the cost per square foot. Um, um, thanks for doing this. I'm, yeah. I'm also doing some other things, and we talked about, um, you know, contingencies being larger the earlier you are in the, the project. And just if you look through, if you wait through the, the MSBA numbers, th there's a there's a, a a line of markups basically. So it's sure. looking at what's the difference between the direct cost and right. the construction cost. And I've I've done it for about a dozen of them. So that markup is anywhere from, let's say, 12% to 23 was, or 24% was the high in the projects that have already been, have gone through to a schematic design phase. With our project, that's 30%, right? Uh -huh. So it's a lot higher. And that's not even the, um, um, what's it called? The soft cost. The soft cost. That's not even that on top of it. So. Um, you know, and, and you can you can break out and you can look at what is it what are the relative percentages people are spending on HVAC on the interior on um, on the site, and so I'm I'm happy to play with this spreadsheet and, and do that, and that might help to kind of say what where are we higher than other schools or lower than other schools and what we're investing in with this design. So, sure. Let us, and first I'm going to also poll people, I'll probably poll folks can say a little past 10.30 so we can have a reasonable discussion about uh, the site. Okay. Um, before you go on to Berkshire discussion about site, I do have to excuse myself and I apologize. Um, it's bad enough for me to show up late, but now I have to leave early. But you, you are in very good hands. Um, Jesse's really all over this. So I'm going to leave you with him. Leave you with Berkshire. Thanks for coming. And whoever heard of gridlock in Amherst? Oh. Yeah. Uh, finals are over at UMass today. That's, that's what happens. Richard, is that your bag? What's, no, it's not. That's mine. What's at UMass today? Yeah, you're going to lose it. Come back. Some of the 
some of the equipment on the site. Then comes landscaping, which um, definitely needs some. How much should it be? Um, and then the second page is the utilities. And I think we're going to have a harder time touching the utilities uh, because we're, we're going to need them for our new systems. Uh, but we can look at that as well. Uh, and the third page is electrical, site lighting, um, which I assume will need as well. But I guess it, it sort of depends on the uh, some of the renovation options, D and E, keep aspects of the parking as they are. And so how far do you go with that? Do you say, oh, well, the lighting is OK for the parking as it is right now. We just need to repave it. And so then those things can come down. But it's probably best if we start with option A, which is the most extensive reworking of the site as required to build the new building and uh, look at where we can, if, if anywhere, um, define the scope. Go ahead, Erin. Uh, sorry to buy it, but um, I think option A is the one that, yes, it needs the most work because you're living in another site and you're ripping up the things. So I'm more concerned about if you have a limited time, B through D or F, because those ones are the ones that are preferred in this design. So right. I don't know how people feel about that. Well, unless I'm reading this wrong, they all. If I would look at this right in the bottom, page 16 totals up the site improvements for landscaping, site development, pedestrian, paving, and parking. Um, Is that they, a subtotal of the page? That's a subtotal. Yeah, I mean, I'm not seeing huge differences. They aren't right now. Between any of the options in terms of the cost at, at this level. Even I mean, within a couple hundred thousand dollars, which I given the scale, A doesn't look like it's yeah, the yeah. most. And B, or no. But C looks like it's the highest. Well, I, that was my point. Is right now the estimate doesn't reuse too much in the site in a renovation approach. Yeah. Um, so if you said, "Oh, we could," well, right. sure, um, gotcha. we don't have to. And I think this kind of, you know, we've talked in our option E building plans. Well, we're reusing this, or we're building this new, and we've sort of addressed daylight as best we could. Um, but in site, we just sort of did the whole thing new right now. Gotcha. And, uh, I'm not sure that's the way you want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I guess the two questions to answer. One is, what, what, what can we save in any of these options? The second question is, what is actually on that site should be tied to a, a school renovation? Because the site is so big that the school itself does not make use of all of those fields. They're, they're a community asset, but they're not a school asset. And should the school project be burdened with maintaining or, or building a soccer field that doesn't get used by the school? And this is when it would be great to have Diane here, but I don't know how much you can talk to how much, you know, when I, every time I'm there at recess, you know, the kids aren't more than, further than the, the yeah. play structures. Right. They're not playing on the playing fields that the junior high ultimate Frisbee team is using after school. Not the back one. Yeah. yeah. But again, it's the, school, the junior high is using it. Right. So then is it, should we be looking at it as a school investment? So. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, the bigger question is like, how much of that site is actually the responsibility of this project? And, so, and, and, I, and I, honestly, I think that is the critical question. And yeah. the, the, it's actually really the critical question. Uh, other than what can you reuse, what can you save reasonably, um, the only other question to me that's really, really critical is this question around programming, is how do you allocate the improvements and what can reasonably be, what should reasonably be included as a cost of an elementary school project versus a different line item in the capital budget. And I'm saying it that way specifically because, and I don't think you're saying this either, no one's saying that you couldn't redo an adult recreational softball field or even that that shouldn't happen. The real question is, where do you put it in terms of a capital budget? Is it part of the school project? Or if the town wanted to do it, would you put it in a different item in the town's budget and take it off of this line item? So I don't know if Mike has any answer any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, I think what's hard for me to assess, other than option A, which we have that nice visual that's on the screen, is that just visually I'm presupposing where things will be on the uh, renovation options, which is hard for me to then imagine what field spaces would be there, what field spaces we need. So uh, maybe we'll get there. I don't want to you know, go too quickly. Well, but, yeah. but I do think that's the thing that I need to see to then answer that question. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure quite who would be the right person to give the context. 
um, but it would be good to understand, you know, what what would we get supportive funding for? Because you know, I guess that to the question about well, okay, I can answer something you know, there. The MSBA will support up to eight percent um, of your uh, construction cost as site work. Yeah. So if we're at twenty four percent right now, we're not we're funding already on our own a bunch of the site work. So. If, the, if that, that becomes a tough consideration, then they push into our project if they can get state money. But I think with utilities and a little bit of the paving, we're going to use up that eight percent. So my guess is that we that this question really impacts all the options A through the N, um, because looking at that slide, I'm suspecting that there's a lot there that would get pushed the other way towards the town um, potential. Karina, but I think I think. Uh, going back to my comment before, I think option A, I think it's an issue for the town that we're taking over the fields that are currently in play right. and the other one. But the, the other was the footprint in principle is not going into the fields. Right. So I don't think that part should be. Or they're going into the fields in different I think it's form. going, the other footprint goes into the mini on the play structure and on the parking lot that's on the side, but not beyond into the soccer fields or the other one. As I remember from the footprint. So I think. Can we go through each one? Yeah. 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 Um, and look, if we could start with option A. Um, one thing I'll point out that's not included in the estimate in the site development is the um, restroom building for the fields because we see that at the town building. Okay. So that's that's already taken out. But in the estimate right now, the fields are or aren't? The fields are all in right now. And I believe the development area is large. It's. Um, Running all the, it's basically everything you see here. It's about 900,000 square feet. Yeah, so I think the cost estimator took a conservative approach and looked at the possible footprint of improvement, including all the ball fields um, and, uh, and all the options in the same way. And so that's something that could be refined if we get that, if we get direction from you about that. Uh, it, to me personally, it, that, that feels a little too big because yeah. my gut says that that's not actually what we would be able to, as a town, afford to do as right. part of right. a school project. I think we would probably reduce it by a third, if not more. Yeah, so this field is existing, and, and the garden is existing. Yep. So I don't know if the project would require work to those. Uh, unless, unless that was directed by, by the building committee. Yeah. I mean, maybe we could just set a general benchmark of what our elementary schools, which all are, you know, and under all these planes, similar size. So in general, um, our schools have one soccer field. Our schools have a younger kid play area, you know, K to two, pre K to two, something like that, and an upper kid play area. I know both of these are represented here. They have a hard top area, um, mostly for winter and basketball, sports like that. Um, and they have a little bit of open space, which doesn't mean, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that the open space is important to people, but it's not like it needs to be a regulation size field, but there's some stu students who play games that just the space is important, that soccer goals aren't helpful. And that's generally, but having two kind of regulation size soccer fields is not in the norm for our elementary schools. I've been in elementary school, both teacher and principal, I think that's a bit of overkill. Um, in terms of the needs of our recesses, we stagger them intentionally, not just because the fields, but we, it's not good about health, the kids are outside. Who's in, like, it's just from a safety perspective, we would, we would organize ourselves that way anyway. Um, so when I look at this, the softball field is um, never used, or almost never used by school staff. It's just not a game that kids choose to play recess, the number of kids, the equipment, it's just not something we do, even for PE class, it's not, Typical um, use, and it certainly would need to be like a regulation size softball field. Even if they, they were doing it in physical education, it wouldn't need to be of that structure. So, I do think there's more in this design than what we would typically have in an elementary school, um, at least based on the community standards we have, and also about how we stagger our recess blocks so that we don't have like a third of the school out or half of the school out at once. So, if I'm hearing you right, the project has taken on too much maybe of the, of the community use of the into the project budget, and we should, we should pull that out. That's my perspective, Kevin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to be kind of realistic about yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> I also point out that any time that we are demoing a building, right. so if that is something that you guys decide is mm -hmm. in the best interest of the community, mm -hmm. the MSBA does mm -hmm. fully help pay the cost of that. That is not considered a site cost. So that is something that, if that is what you feel like is the best um, thing to do for the building, to demo it eventually or in the next five, 10 years, that is something that is really helpful to have MSBA help pay for that. In this case, on 
not a the building footprint is demoed and sports fields or other outdoor amenities are, are placed there um, so that kind of can help to offset help offset the total budget costs yeah. i think that gives us something we can work with um yeah just gonna try to move to the others see if i have yeah is there consensus that um Superintendent Morris's description of what we really need for the school should be the scope of this, that one soccer field, one kids play area, one hardtop area, a little open space, and this sort of Two, two yeah. kids play areas. Two kids play Because you have little and big kids. Exactly. Could, could we, is that the sense? That can be the well, let's, let's check that out. I, yeah. I, I think the answer is yes, but Corinna. Yeah, but my, yes, but. I would say that we don't always need to have it new, sometimes we can right. reuse right. what we have. So that's, I think that's the difference between the scope of all the projects, that in one of the, in A, we're gonna have to have new sites fixed to the play areas, but I think in the other ones, we don't. So I think Depending we have, on the option, that's right. that it is when they're doing it, it has to look what's existing and that if it needs to be modified. But yeah, and I think, and I'm not the person who could do this, but I think as the project move along, we want to assess the current state of those playgrounds and ball fields and whether there's any work that we would want to include in a project if we're doing school. I'm not going to wager uh, an opinion on that because I don't, I'm not at Florida Playground often enough to, to give a strong opinion, but I just, that's the only caution is if some of our playground equipment is breaking down or is slightly out of date or not up to code, things like that. Um, we just we want to probably assess that along the way. Not at this point, but just my only caution. And, and actually, do you have a question about option A? Sorry, now you just got option B up, but you go. Um, so the, where the older kids play area is under option A, I guess it's just, it wouldn't be affected by the construction, it would be affected by where the new fields are. Because it's all the way to the, I'm not gonna use directional. North. Yeah, north, north. That's the west. The west. It's the north. west. It's the west. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so um, so it, it's it's a little remote. If you went to the left with your mouse, it's right, it's right. sort of over there because that's yeah, the outline of the, the current building, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's the basketball court. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it just a question is: Is that too close to where the demo would be? Like, I don't know all that, but it's not literally where the building's going. So in terms of reusing current playground equipment, it's just a question. Yeah, yeah I think on A, you would just assume. Oh, that's that's right. Right. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, they like I have a question. Fourteen thousand square foot of paint area. That's typical. That, that's a basketball size place. Full size basketball. No more, much more because the gym is sixty five. So that's like two basketball courts. You have side. a pretty substantial big play area around the gym now. I think we kept it kind of in line with what you have. Yeah. Uh, All of our other schools have two basketball courts and sometimes you know the one of them have lower hoops because again we have younger children playing and one have more regulation 10 foot hoops which is better for all the kids in the community so that that's pretty typical for wild with have two and at our farm they also have the kitchen three actually don't count them, but i'm not going to count them all the farm um i take it this probably doesn't factor the geothermal well location because i know some schools like discovery down in Arlington, i think they put the wells under their new soccer field so if you're ripping up Whole bunch of this I you're rebuilding those soccer fields on top of your wells so I, I think assuming all new for those elements for a might be a safe assumption that way we can use those areas for geothermal so if we go that route that's right and just just formally comment on your last question I, I think I heard consensus I didn't hear anyone objecting to that the list of things that Mike did so I, I would say for you all that that's kind of your direction is thinking about that scope the way Mike described it Okay. Ready for B? It's just six. <laughs> uh, Eventually. So to apply the same logic, I think the, uh, the new soccer field, which you need to develop this area anyways because you're demolishing the building here. Right? So put a soccer field in, maybe that's your geothermal um, well field as well. And then the two playgrounds, the paved play, um, and then all of the parking and any clearing that's required for side for ground mounted array. And a um, question about this might be, I know that the, the fields where the ground, where you just pointed the ground mounted array is to the south and to the right hand of the page are currently used for soccer practice. So does that, so then the 
is that a town or school cost in terms of developing that soccer field to the north or the west side of the page? So uh, I would argue that the schools almost never use that just because of the lack of proximity to the building. It's really far away from the safety perspective. The fields in the back are used much more frequently. So uh, I'm not trying to put all the costs on the town side, but I do think in terms of what we need for a school, it's not something that I would argue. I think the one field in this model would be sufficient for our school usage. Yeah, I've not even been to I think those are existing, though, right? Those are existing, so yeah. we could we could basically yeah. draw the line here at the yeah. 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 Conservancy line. Right. Sure. No, no, I was just going to say the same thing, that, that really the only change here in terms of the school costs would be drawing that line toward the back and omitting the work to the back of, to the north of the field. Whatever that is, the north of the TV. Up. Up. Makes me feel better. See that in the narrow and see that points north. Right. Uh, understood. I'll turn my head. I guess the other topic we could discuss is there are new paved areas required, um, but even in option A, we're we're sticking very closely to the existing paving footprint, uh, but the existing paving is very deteriorated. Yes. Um, so I think we have to assume repaving. Yes, I'm sure. Yes. Um, repaving, the cost of repaving is different from making new roads, right? It would be less. Yeah, yeah so that the doses has to be bigger than those. It's still a significant cost, and, you know, grinding down the pavement. Yes. Yeah. But if it's lower, the base cost. Yeah, it will be lower. Sorry. Right. So if, since we're going through these one below, this is great. Um, in the bottom right. Sure. Can I just come up there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know what we're this big blank space. Yeah, yeah. What what's that? Yeah, that's I, and is that can that be used for anything? Or I mean, is is that the I don't know what it's a garden. It's a it's a hole in yeah. the thing. And which is I'm not saying go every inch of the site, but what or is it? Could the definitely thing? be used. I mean it could be an outdoor play space possibly as the, as the interior laid out it seemed better to have the play kind of where we put them um, near the cafeteria and then near the pre-k classroom um, but I mean if you could think of a way to use that we could reconfigure the parking obviously and make it more vertical and encroach less to the south um, you know it was just a question so it's kind of block diagrams but if you have an idea of what should go there um, I'm just realizing that we don't have a preschool playground we do, it's this uh, two to five. Two to five. It's the ages. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So right now, like itself. Crocker and yeah. Fort Worth, so um, Crocker has three playgrounds. Yeah. One for preschool, one for K through two, and then three through six, somewhere in there. We um, would have, and so we're showing. Yeah, we would have both the K through two and three to six um, in this area. Now we could break it up into two areas, um, but that, that square footage would the two play areas. So there's just two line items though in the estimate. Yeah, and you probably didn't pick up on it. So does that need to be three? Maybe, but I think the cost of each would probably come down because he's looking at one big okay. area. area. Um, and then it's a level of detail that we haven't shown. Okay, anymore. but it accounts for I think we I think the we're population. Probably okay there. Yeah, like okay. it's a good point. So I'm gonna make one suggestion, maybe one process suggestion to make sure that we get through. So just one thing and not for now, it's just to know how many parking spots are accommodated by this model. And again, I don't want to go off on that, but it actually matters in terms of site because where the addition is, I think there's current parking. So I'm just wondering where that's reflected because there's a side parking lot. Yeah. So it's around there, right? So yeah. we've tried to stay parking count neutral. Yeah. Okay. All the options. Yeah. I think you have 180 or 190. Right. Do you recall? No, that's helpful. Yeah. And I just didn't see it that well. And the second is just having been through. One of these processes before where the playgrounds are is a really really complicated yeah. thing that i think all the suggestions are good i have more but actually but i'm not sure that's the goal today right. um, right. because i mean you know, i think that there's all sorts of moving pieces on that one that that may not be the time you have a big flat site yeah I would, put them on I would actually argue it's more important that we account for the cost of something yeah. than yeah. necessarily yeah. where where it goes yeah. Right. Yeah. because i mean honestly I hate to say who cares, but it's like you could put it a million different places, and whenever we're actually building a project, we're going to go through all those arguments 
I mean, it's the same. It's just probably the same thing about that blank area there, right. unless there's an actual functional use that we need to account for. Yeah, I um, think only in so much as how it, it affects right. the cost. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, right. so right. exactly. Because if the parking is configured in a different way and the road sign is configured in a different way, then maybe it's lower cost. Substantial. If, if, yeah. substantial. if there is, I would yeah. say it's probably not too much because it's just grass. Um, so it would be grass over here, or maybe a little less grass that would be it. But the seating costs wouldn't be very much. There's not a grading component to it. So. And I think to your point, we do we do have, like Jesse's saying, we do have a flat site. We, we care very much about how those relationships happen. For example, you may want the kids closer to the cafeteria so you have efficiency of movement That's in and out. And I think we have space on the plan and flexibility in our plan to work those yeah. efficiencies in for you. Great. Thank you. Ready for a seat? Let's go see. Yeah, let me get you to do it. Um, all right, option C. It seems like these two existing softball fields, again, and any space between them, will be outside of our, uh, out of our scope. Again, now we have two soccer fields instead of one. Uh, so you only set one, one soccer field to be required. So we can also put that limit line right through here. Option C keeps the existing play areas um, so, where they are. So the soccer fields, in this one, these are the ones that we have right now in place. This is the parking area is the same as the one that we have right now. So we're not being actually, not even those two soccer fields we see really because right now they are there and we would not. Your question is a good one. Do we need to spend money on the existing soccer fields? Um, As part of the project, since we are not building and we are not touching, they are there. Uh, yes, in an ideal world, let's do all of them. Right. But if we are looking at costs, if we are not building on it and we are not intervening nearby, do we have to do it? I would, I would probably argue in this case, no, because the, the level, and Mike, chime in if I'm going way straight here, but um, the level of soccer field needed at the elementary school versus what you'd want it for for adult play or something it, it doesn't it probably doesn't require any upgrading um, so my only question on that I don't disagree yeah philosophically so I have two questions one is just I don't like where they are just from a safety perspective which yeah, I don't again, I just said let's not focus on it but I actually have pretty significant concerns from a safety perspective they're on the side of the parking lot where the building right. is so I mean I, I think about where you, yeah so you, you answered you where I was with this cursor for the school um, <laughs> that's probably what you do in this option. Yeah. And the second, no sites. Yeah, and if I could say one other one, the thing I don't know, quite literally, is if those are going a little south of where the current soccer fields are, um, that there are right. wetness issues. I know that's flat, but there are wetness issues that have to be taken care of because of the field. I know those fields can get wet on that yeah. side, and I just don't have a great orientation of is this going further than the existing fields go. And is there any complication with that where they're actually in the upper left? Um, no, on the right. Mid right. Yeah, yeah like right. it's going, my guess is it's going a little closer to the property line than the current fields are on the right. Right. Um, and so I just don't know about the land well enough to know if that's a problem or not. So it's just, it's really a question. Can you clarify? Can in this one, I thought you were not moving them. Well, yeah, you just proposed that, which I think is agreeable to everyone is that there'd be no reason to redevelop those existing fields um, which are sitting there right now right. with their somewhat small drainage issues right that they get a little soggy um, so that would be outside of the scope of the project which is different from that drawing right. we were saying oh we build new fields there i think what we realized is the drawing really should put a new field over by the um, gymnasium i think yeah. the community would not want to have a field there when they you have soccer all the soccer programs, they use both fields simultaneously at the same time. And if you have them in two parts of the building, all the programming, the after school programming gets different. Well, Whenever you have the things. soccer practice, right. yeah. they use both fields at the same time. Right. But that's. Well, you could, couldn't, I mean, if, if you have two fields currently over to the right hand side of the screen, uh, which I guess is south. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then, uh, then you, if you're not touching them, you don't have to touch them. But I think what Mike was saying, which makes enormous sense to me, anyways, is that you you got to build a new field, another field, for the actual elementary school use, 
by the building where the where that current other diamond is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to do that because you're not going to walk kids across the parking lot. Makes sense. I think we'll remove that diamond and put a soccer field there. Yeah, but not spend any money on. Them. Yeah, but then not spend any on, right. on the second right. part of the screen. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, where do the kids currently play soccer? On the field behind the school to the east of the school. I think I've got that right. It's probably um, beyond the So right where the, the, the edge of the baseball field, the right, yeah. right near right field. Mm -hmm. Right where Jesse is. Right there. Is it better there? there. Yes. With the garden there? Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. yeah. Like that we're now going from cardinal directions to baseball fields orientation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm actually better at this one, Maria, so I appreciate that. Uh, so <laughs> if, yeah. if they're playing right where the, the gray, where the paved play area, yeah. that's actually currently a play field. Yeah. And it's oh, if, if it is OK, then you just actually may want to move the paved play and the 5 through 12 play over. <laughs> yeah, we could put, right field. We could put them on the softball field. And then field. you don't have to redo yeah. all three things. Yeah, yeah. I Either way. Um, it's going to be similar. Right. Go ahead. I don't see the community garden on here. It moved um, into the school footprint. Oh, that cool. Would be all right. There's oh, the garden. That's cool. That's nice. Yeah. Um, and then so what do we, do we decide for this that we would budget for all new play structures even if they're existing? Brought that up. I think that's that's the most responsible thing to do at this point. Play structures are usually out of outside of code regulations after just a few years, so we bring them all up to code. Um, even though these happen to retain the existing ones, I guess the question would be: You need this play structure for the school for educational. You need this play structure for educational. This is your pre-K, K through five, K through six. These are these town use playgrounds. Um, would we need to work on any of it? Right, so these are additional playgrounds. Um, I don't know if they're even reflected in the estimate. I'd have to look. So, but I think from what you've said is that the school is using this playground and this playground. They wouldn't necessarily need to do any work to these, which would become town playgrounds with this town restroom facility building, which exists right now, and these existing fields all around. So all of this is going to be outside of our scope. I will say that the, um, the, the line item for the play equipment does seem a little low from what we've seen across multiple projects. It might be double or triple that. And in addition to that, um, there's, a, there's some movement within the state MAAB, Massachusetts Architectural Accessibility Board, to, to make a lot of changes to the standards that we use for design. And one of that is to say that um, a fiber mulch surfacing, their, their tank is no longer accessible. So that they're requiring municipalities to move to portable play surfaces. So you're going from three dollars a square foot. Well, they want to propose these changes. That well, the law hasn't quite changed yet. There were hearings last last summer, and they said that the changes were going to happen the first of the year. I followed up, and they said, "Well, we're not sure when those are going to happen if they're going to happen." So that's something for you guys also to weigh in and see how you want to deal with that um, with that possible change or, or hold on until until that actually. But the, the cost implication, you go from six, you know, thirty-five to sixty thousand dollars for for surfacing, play surfacing that's above and beyond your play equipment, to two hundred eighty thousand dollars for play surfacing. So that that's what you're talking about with that. Right. Yeah, I'd agree on the looking at the playground budget. I've seen that kind of budget for a residential project with much fewer kids. So yeah. that number probably has to be. You're entering my second. Before we get too far from this, um, uh, the MSBA, I believe, has guidelines, or the state, or somebody must have guidelines for what's the number of square feet you need for a number of kids. So right. that might, um, if you could just toss that at it's us, usually around that seventy-five square feet for for different things, right? This for the this for the play structure, and then there's for the place space or whatever. I can't remember how it's defined. Field or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, that might be helpful to have so that we could get a sense of like why did they pick these you know, why, why did they pick this square foot and, and what is it be for, for, for different size children? Yeah, and are we conforming with it then do we have the costs right? 
And one of the things that I don't, this may sound like a funny thing to say, but when it comes to a, adult or town recreational areas, including play areas, I'm happy to cut those things out because I think reasonably that goes on a different budget or a different line item for the town. What I what I want to caution us against doing is, this is something Mike said earlier, is some of the existing outdoor use areas might need a, a refresh. And what I wouldn't want to do is propose, even on a feasibility study, propose a building in which somebody said, well, what's the end product? Is, well, these things are going to be completely refreshed and new. And somebody would say, well, you spent 50 million bucks and you still have like a circa 1987 play area in the back? What the hell happened, right? I mean, someone's going to say that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I, mean, I mean, but also it just doesn't, just roll it into the project, right? Get, you know, refresh this thing so that our play areas, I mean, within reason, within reason. But double, double the play area, the current area. If we think about those costs. Yeah. If we refresh also the town ones, it would double the no, cost. No, I'm not I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in terms of the reuse of the of the school specific ones. Okay. I would just want to make sure you're using a realistic number. A realistic number and also right. if it needs to be this is something Mike said it a while ago. If it looks like it needs to be refreshed, let's build in refreshing it. on this side of the project, I think right. I heard you just say that. Yeah, I mean, I, my side. preference would be that parking lots are, we don't have students on field on the opposite of parking lots. Parking. So very similar to, my thoughts on this anyway, very similar to option C, you know, where that uh, current softball field is, you know, have one of the fields over there, not worry about the two existing fields on the side. Okay. Uh, everything else is okay. I know the orientation is slightly different, but I my sure. opinion would be the same. Softball and baseball fields at this site. I've never seen a game there. Oh my gosh, yes. Yes, okay, I just got there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we will find you there. There you go. Isn't it the, far, isn't it the far right one, though? The upper. We, no, we use better. all three fields. Really? Okay. Yeah. We are, uh, we are, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of softball going on. Point. Come on any evening in between spring and that far was lit, right? And that, that's the big yeah. one is yeah. the one that is in the um, southeastmost part. The, yeah. the bigger one. Right. The one that has the lights. That, yeah. Yeah, that's, well, I knew that one was yeah, jamming. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, but there, we use the other stuff. Huh? Yeah, plus Grove Park, plus oh, Kiwanis Field. Yeah. So, yeah, anybody who'd like to join us all, I think you should. Please it's like an opportunity for recruiting. Now. <laughs> we all members are always welcome. <laughs> so we're moving that softball field for the soccer field and for the school that's going to impact. The it it well, would, but I mean, you know, I the think that that's a, that's a town discussion. Place. I can tell you that two out of the three Groff fields is getting into things we don't want to know. Two out of the three Groff fields are used. One is not. I don't oh, know why. Okay. Um, one out of the two Kiwanis is used. Field to play on, but the three Fort River are the most sought-after sites. We that's where we try to play most of our games. Okay. It's getting simpler. This is nice. <laughs> yeah, it's less and less. So the difference in option E is the gym is back where it currently exists, and the safe play is basically where it exists, yeah. and the playgrounds nearby the gym. Uh, the cafeteria is moved this way as well. So um, Which one are we on? Yeah. yeah the, well, this is the most minimal, so all we're really adding is preschool. In this cafeteria case. is up this yeah. way, so to go to recess, yeah. you have to go out and around. Um, we may need to look at this moving over, but not too worried about locations. The existing field that you use outside of gym is not affected by this option. 
So I, I think if we're consistent with what we previously said, is these two soccer fields which we propose being new could just be the existing fields. And our site scope for option E is really just going to be limited to um, these paved areas right around the building and the playground, the new playground areas right around the building. And a new dedicated pre-k play, right? Yeah, which is here. Uh, but you know, it needs to be finally located. Yeah. But we would include it. Okay. Oh, sir. Uh, would it make sense to just designate the soccer, like slide that uh, left hand ball up over, and but not include it in the cost? I'm just thinking of in market, this, you know, optional community right. ball field. Just, I don't want to have softball folks <laughs> against the project because they're losing the field, but just to indicate there's room, right. but we're not costing it as part of the project. It, no matter what happens on this site, I guess, you it's, know. It's, or any of our school sites for that matter, there's going to be a bigger community conversation about those additional uses because there are heavily sought after outside spaces. And so that, that, that's another conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, Mike, and I think yeah. just more generally, I think yeah. to go and know other people will. I mean, I think if this project or some version of this project moves forward, that's the community conversation that we want to have. Yeah. Right? So I think for feasibility, I think the way, my personal opinion, the way we're thinking about it is the right way. And someone might say, hey, you're doing this project and that raises that question and then a future building committee says how do we want to do that against community not just the school input but the larger community input it's not just school people who are voting on this it would be right. the whole community so I think it's a really good point to be aware of that potential discussion yeah could you show what you're designated as out of the scope of the project so I think that has an impact not only on the play area so for people it's also in the landscape in the same you were assumed they were assuming the uh, area in landscaping about uh, the cost of seeding and planting. Yeah. yeah. Right? So. Well, that's all this changes that that's going to yeah. change that yeah, overall scope. Yeah, because this is so. over, over $100,000 of landscaping. Sure. Yeah. So a minor earthwork, which I guess we skipped at the beginning. Uh -huh. It's based on a larger area. So yeah. we could tailor those areas down there. Yeah. 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 basically know. proposing adding a Project scope line, which would get drawn on all these plans that yes. would limit those square footages sure. in a very clear, gra graphically clear way. Yeah, I think that'll work well. So we'll add that. Yeah. So, can I ask a question? If you go down on the mechanical utilities, all that, I think that doesn't change for all the projects, right? The next the utilities, we can discuss any changes to utilities. And, and I'd probably go so far as to say, Let's not try to poke at these line no. items. Let them revise the scope. Yeah, yeah. But that's what I'm getting at is all these little colony factors. Yeah. So I don't want to derail, but I have a question about kind of all the options in total. Yeah, yeah. we're ready to I don't know, wait to wait hold that question. Are we done with site? Yeah. Let's yeah. find out. Yeah. 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 Um, utilities take up so much of the site development costs. At the end of the day, people, what they see above the ground, they think that's where all the site costs went. It's actually all underneath the ground. Stormwater, um, stormwater design at this point is very conservative. The numbers that are here are very conservative in the sense that we don't have enough information to base the sizing of the systems to the state standards. So one thing that you may consider doing is having a deep hole test kit. The cost is about $2,000, maybe a little bit less. Um, it's an excavator goes out, digs a deep hole, a soil evaluator goes and looks at the soil, and that just gives our firm the ability to size the systems and look at the square footage of the building, the square footage of the parking, and find some of these numbers to see see where it goes. So if you're, if you're looking at a really finer grain, if you're worried about the finer grain um, utility costs, that's an exercise we could go through. If you want to leave it at this like, bigger feasibility brush stroke, we can leave it at the cost. I guess we'll talk about this. Uh, the discussion about uh, play surface, soft play surface area, I feel like we should resolve sooner rather than later. And, but it, it, I don't think it's a. You know, I think we need to make an, a, we need to make an assumption for the project. Um, it's not clear where, when and where the state's going to do it. But since we're already assuming a couple years ahead, I mean, I don't know if, if that regulation will pass. Right now, the it's a big 
deep question about when the AAB is really going to get reissued. They're, they and the governor's office are having um, some issue around other aspects of the regulation. But I think it's safer to assume a more conservative uh, approach. I will also add there have been cases that the AAB has heard and um, filed on. So if someone comes to a municipality with a complaint claiming that the wood surfacing is inaccessible, if it's not, it is, if it's maintained, if it's not maintained, then it's not accessible. And so in those cases, the ruling has been that it's not accessible and you have to pay for all this testing and maintenance or put in more in place. So, Mike. so uh, just a slightly variation on this conversation, I think separate from what the legal constraints are, it may be the case that the community says we want our playground to be as accessible as possible. Belcher Town has a fantastic example of this. They would want to go see a, a truly accessible playground. And so and there may be legal pieces, but I think in this community, I believe there's going to be people who rightfully are advocating for building a new playground, how are we not making it as accessible as possible? Whether the, the law, I mean, it's like I compare it to like the net zero piece. Like, there's no one externally saying you need to do net zero, yet the community says we value that. And I, I imagine that this may, be, may fall into some category around accessibility. A, rela a related point, actually, uh, uh, is that on January 22nd, we're actually getting back a presentation from a consultant who's doing an ADA audit of all of our school facilities. and. That's something that the school committee and the leadership of the district, the superintendent, really wanted to do, but it also came out of substantial public comment and engagement with us that um, that this was a value we wanted to understand and push. So, so I, I think I, I'm just echoing what you're saying, but that is it's not even a foreseeable issue. It's actually a living one with the facilities we currently have. Two things. One is we have fairly generous contingencies built in. Would that cover additional costs? That's a question. The other thing is I I would like to speak in favor of doing the, the yeah. test pit. Go back to the is, we'll the, to is the cost of pulling place in the budget? I believe it is. We have um, if you look for play area two and five um, in option A, we've got ninety four thousand plus two hundred thirty five thousand. That would cover it over three hundred thousand dollars for the place service. Um, play area two and five, and play area five and twelve, right below baseball and softball field. How, how it's three hundred thousand dollars. Should get us something. It's not the, the, the cost is separated into two. One is the square footage, and the other one is the play structure per se. So I think the answer is we made an attempt to put it in the budget. We'll check and make sure it's yeah, quite right. But sure um, if you wanted to go back to the mulch, we could reduce the cost of site, which is what we were thinking about. But it's already yeah, we need to look at that also and make sure it's the same. Yeah. 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 yeah, check it out. We'll, we'll continue to work on this. So, so what's the, what's the, the test pit issue again? Yeah, can we can we address the test pit? Well, I guess what I would say is, I think we need to address where our our, our funding budget is. I don't disagree with the idea of, of wanting to explore that further, but I wonder if we should not table that to our next meeting, um, and, and and explore it in that bigger context because we haven't looked at our budget in a while. It's not a lot of money, and I just to support. It. I have a question. Didn't we go under budget in one of our tests? That's why I want to get back to the budget. Well, the budget's not on the Let's just take a look at it at our next meeting. So, uh, Heather, then. Do we have to perform that test in the winter? Because we're trying to wrap up our our report here before springtime, and if everything's frozen, things aren't going to flow. Right. I'll double check. I think, I think, from what I understand, the soil evaluator looks at the color of the soil where the water level is. Might they be able to get that from our boring information? Not unless, yeah, it just gives us an idea where groundwater is. It doesn't confirm the, the classification of soil and how well it drains. So my suggestion is going to be that we probably make the budget uh, a regular agenda item. And yes. I'll, since I'm the one with access to the this, I'll report starting at the, at the next meeting just to regularly where we stand. Right. Okay. 
Yeah. Can we do that in the context of getting? Is this we have to lose corn. No. We're still there. Uh, so let's just get ourselves squared. Can we get an estimate of what the cost would be? Yes. For the test pits, so then we have that conversation. Whether we do it or not, we can have like one informed conversation around whether we do it. Right. And sort of get it over with. That, that sounded good. like I want to get things done. So I guess we're directing you to get it. Just okay. give us a ballpark so we can have that conversation. So, uh, so I, I have a question about just kind of all the options in total, and I have no notion of the answer, but I'm curious. At what point is it appropriate for this committee to start talking about whether we continue with all six of these options? Hmm. Well, that's really part of our charge, though, is, is that basket. And so I'm going to well, defer to oh, Eric. But yeah, I might. Go ahead. Um, because, I mean, there's six options right now. And if I, I know these cost estimates, are, cost estimates are, are still being worked on, but option D is more expensive than option C, takes a year longer to construct, and on the plus side, we get to keep more of the building that we need. Um, <laughs> option E saves us $800,000 over option C to, to again do even less. And, you know, we, again, the numbers aren't final, but at what point is it useful to spend energy going through all five, five or six options every time? Are some of these options something that we might want to ask the designers to stop? Stop. With, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have a notion. I mean, I guess you know where I'm leaning, but I don't have a notion of what at what stage it's appropriate to do that. I wanted to ask a question about um, some of the options as well, because just as I was going through, um, options A, B, and D have an approximate square foot of 85, but options. C and E actually are, uh, this is for A, just for, um, my A problem. So if you look at, so, oh, I'm not, okay. Uh, so the, the base option. The base option, yes. right? So there's, there's, there's the base and then there's one, two, and three. So um, so for C and E, it's it's about 80,000 square feet. So I, I had two questions, one of which, I mean, that makes it, that's 5,000 square feet. That, that's a big difference. Sure. Are, how are we, how are we, getting everything we need in 80 and some and then 85 and others and that's going to make a big difference and if you look at the final cost right. sure then that's gonna that's one of the reasons that it's different lower than D right right so um, I understand the question yeah um, <laughs> we're we're showing you all the rooms and how they work out in each option C and E use the existing gym whereas D provides the new larger gym that's one of the biggest differences in terms of square footage uh, and originally we wanted to look at that as an option, whether it made sense to reuse the existing gym and live within its smaller footprint. If you say now, okay, we decided it's not, it's not making sense, we're saving a little bit but not that much, then we should go away from that. That accounts for maybe two-thirds of the differential in square footage the, um, because when you add the gross factor to the gym square footage. Um, the, um, the rest of it, I think, is due to the variability between the layouts. So when you say they're about 85, well, they're, they're ranging a little bit depending on how things fit together. Um, and so you're gonna get different amounts of um, gross. The two-story building has a, um, stairwells and elevators, so that drives up the overall square footage for the same program area. We, we tried in the studies to keep the program areas equivalent, as you know, and yet, in option E, we looked at just a just an addition for pre-K. We fit everything into the rest of the square footage as best we could. You know. So it's fair to say it's mostly circulation. I think it's mostly circulation. Um, you can look at it if you see a room that's not showing up. Let me know. So it's the grossing factor that's mostly different in addition to the the different size of the gym. The gym plus is the, the grossing reason, factor, and then I'd say grossing factor is second. There's efficiency in C and E. So, um, at, at least from the, I think I can speak from the perspective of the school committee on this. Um, and actually, even recently in a meeting, uh, in some conversations, I don't think the committee ever expected to get six options anyway. And so, six options is more than anyone anticipated. Um, I understand that you can kind of take off option F because that's really just giving you a baseline understanding 
of the cost of fixing the existing structure. And since that doesn't meet any of our educational program objectives, you can almost kind of discount it and throw it away and say it's just useful information to have and it's not. It's not actually an option. It's just baseline information. Um, the challenge, and this may sound like a very funny thing to say, Anthony, but the challenge for me is I think if we, if we wanted and we saw benefits to the quality of the study to cut down the number of options, that would be fine. What I would, would kind of wouldn't want to do is I wouldn't want to spend the next six weeks fighting tooth and nail and killing each other to try to figure out which option to eliminate. Uh, and so if there was substantial disagreement over, if there was an option that we could eliminate that everyone kind of agreed, look, you don't need to study that, that's fine, then that's great. I think if in the end we're gonna kill each other over it, I'd say, my God, just keep it in and how does, if having more information anyway. has never hurt anyone. I, I very much agree. I, I definitely don't want it, if there's strong constituencies for each option, I, I don't think it's to our advantage to fight over it. I just was curious about having, and not deciding today, certainly, but deciding in the next couple of meetings, are there some options that we are, as a group, we already know we're not really interested in, and saving the architect and ourselves some time. I think there could be two ways to think about that question. I mean, the report is these diagrams in my mind, um, and we can edit them as you wish, but I think um, they've been included and they exist, so wouldn't you exclude them in your report? I think the question is, do you then, because the report's it's pretty big, but are you going to focus the report down um, in the um, summary or in conclusions, whatever, and, and look at options more closely, perhaps? And, and maybe that's the that's what we're realizing now is that while we may not recommend an option, I'm just throwing this out there, but we want to talk about what we learned in, in the study, and that there may be some options that seem to us to have more um, potential. Impact. Yeah, however, I, I'm thinking that that would be a natural way to end the report. And we may want to consider how we position this study in relationship to the MSBA traditional process. And I know that through other feasibility studies that are directly through MSBA, they like to at least see if you addressed a, a renovation, ad reno, and a new building. So that type of framework, you can, you can choose to not proceed with any of those, but the fact that you have those three pathways, um, this might frame your options going forward. So I, I think we should, I mean, I, I don't, also I know we're running out of time. I don't think we should try to make a decision today around this. I think it'd actually be more helpful if you were, if you had a concept, uh, and so two things. One, if we assume that the basic, the complete study with its appendices included all six versions, and I know there's some variants, but I'm saying all six versions, and also, um, as I sort of banged the table like Nikita Khrushchev last time, uh, making sure we include information around not having preschool as well as having preschool so that no one has to fight to figure out what that cost looks like or that difference looks like. Um, then to me the idea that an executive summary or the front end of the report focuses on new, ad reno, and reno makes complete sense to me, but I think what we want the committee to be able to do is visualize what that looks like for the report so people can see, does this, do I feel like I'm losing too much granularity, or does this look right in terms of the information? And it certainly would solve what we were, certainly from the school committee's perspective, what we were looking for, and what the town is looking for, too. Well, I think it's something we can come back to um, at another meeting. Yeah. I, mean, I, have, I have questions that it comes with the time we do there. Well, that's, I was, what I was going to do is, okay. if we can, we can stay together for another couple minutes and hopefully to at least pick off a couple of things here. Better. Because I put on a future meeting agenda, I understand this sort of the realm of the big picture is um, what we're really focusing on as the base case. You know, which which of the schemes get the highlighted yellow and the box around them for oh, the, right. this scheme costs this. And I think that gets really into where we started this conversation. You know, what are our um, energy use uh, as the targets for the renovation? Right now, we're saying it's the, the higher one without meeting at zero, and it really makes a false comparison between the new structure and um, these ad renos because, you know, I think I think it's important to anyway. I think that could be a big conversation, and it's just okay for a future agenda. For a future agenda. Okay, I do have public outreach 
Um, but I'm kind of thinking I might like to move geotech and survey kind of report up. Um, okay. Um, so the survey, um, Berkshire, uh, as I mentioned last time, has completed the field work. They estimate they have a week left um, in the office so to finalize the report. Um, that's a full week of working days, so it's going to be after the holidays, probably. Uh, that was my last conversation with Berkshire. Um, on Geotech, the uh, last town signature was achieved yesterday. Um, the O'Reilly, Talbot, and Akun is already in touch with Diane about setting up on the site. Um, they are raring to go, so I assume that I, I assume that is going to move right much faster. But probably after between now and New Year's. Oh, I'm certain. I'm, I doubt that very much. <laughs> Um, they, can they do it in the winter with the yes. process of yeah. mm -hmm. they, they use a drilling rig and go right through the process. That is all for survey June. Cool. Um, and given that we are about an hour past where we thought we were going to be. Um, <laughs> you, did, you said 1030 at one point. Yes, I did. And, and, and well, well, we also thought, I think we, would, we were going to be lucky to achieve quorum for that long. We've been very lucky to be able to keep it this time. I think we're still yeah. lucky. We, yeah. had a, we, had a, we had a working group on public health. Yeah, we had met. Okay. Okay. You said you had or have not? No, have not met. We have met. not met. Cool. I was so <laughs> absorbed with other things. I didn't send out an email. Um, but we, we need to do that, and I will, I will circulate the, the email. I should have circulated before. I guess one No, I've already spoken. Oh, I was just going to say, on the public outreach, it's sort of in that vein. I was wondering, um, in the meeting report that I, for the 11th, um, was remembering that we had said we would write a stamp um, unreviewed on that um, TSP, and I was wondering if that had been done on the website, because last time I checked it hadn't been. I have not checked. Yeah. Stamped yeah. review? Unreviewed. So there's there's uh, something on our website that is sitting there that has some pretty, you know, TSP will make these changes, except we walk those back, and the committee has never talked about those things. And so it's just sitting on the website like, we did this thing, and we haven't done that thing, and so we need to say oh, on clearly. The front, oh, on the front page? Yeah, like, just on the first draft. page. Yeah. I, 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 that's, all, that's all been updated. Oh, okay. So, so the PDF was changed to, to include something that said not reviewed. PDF? No, the PD, I didn't change any PDFs. Okay. We should change. Okay. We should get a, a stamp draft document. That's what we call it. I have a comment on membership. Okay. Um, with our current fantastic momentum on membership, I'm wondering if it's worth asking for a, a t the teacher position to be filled again. I think we could, well, of course we don't. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> well, but yes, uh, but, uh, but yes, but yes, but yes, I think we, we should uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. give it a try. We'll, we'll give it, a, we'll give it yeah. a shot. We had talked about even reaching out to retirees. Here's the cool thing about this. The farther this goes on, the less time commitment we're actually yes. asking. <laughs> yes, this is true. <laughs> Come for a couple weeks and enjoy it. And it's for the fun part. Yeah. I think we were talking about it before the meeting started, but um, to have uh, the, the, once a facilities director is on board with the school district, to get that. they will presumably join us because that's a position. I mean, the, the position itself is supposed to be a member of the, it's not, not a person, but a position. So it's that, per, that person will need to be sworn in. Automatically. That person yeah, will need to be sworn in, or she will need to be sworn in, but yeah. shouldn't need to. Right. Will it be and that's moving forward. I, mean, I know yeah. that that's moving forward. Oh, do we know the start date for that? That's not a, that's not official yet. Too. Yeah. But it's in process. And this is not okay. Yeah. And I, I just want to publicly thank um, John Baker. <laughs> yes, I had to do a, a bit of rewriting. I thought I had it all set and then redo all my little letters, but it got done. So um, I don't think we have any invoices to review. No. So I think we could actually be done. Move to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor. Uh, <laughs> could I say something about your, just quickly, the last go round when we had presentations by the previous the regional, what, no, not too real Jason, uh, uh, building committee, they only really talked about two and kind of blew the other ones aside. So if you're going into public forums, even though some of these are not desirable, I think they need to be presented yeah. with a little bit of information. Otherwise, you hurt your credibility as a committee. So I, maybe you all thought about that. But that's I watched the other group, and they had nine, nine different um, designs. And they really focused on two. And the other ones, well, you know, 
you can say that, but I think you still need to present the information. But, but I, th I think, in, I mean, I think in here, this is actually why I raised my point about wanting okay. to see what it looked like to get a um, I don't, I don't to get the.